Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the next Quant Club. Um, today, we have a special guest, Tim DeLise, uh, also known as Jeffrey the Wind in the Numerai competition. Um, he's been doing some part-time work for Numerai, and uh, today he's going to talk a little bit about what he's been working on. Um, so, uh, yeah, please feel free to ask questions or interrupt at any point. I um, want this to be a discussion as much as possible, but uh, I think if you're ready, Tim, we can get started. All right, thank you, MDO. Yeah, thanks everyone for uh, for coming and 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 like you said, please uh, just you know ask any questions uh, that that you that you have as we go. Um, so I'll get right into it. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a PhD researcher uh, right now at the University of Montreal, and so yeah, I've been doing. Uh, some part-time internship research work with Numerai. So this is a project called uh, Era Splitting that I've been working on for, for a little while now. Um, so we'll get right into it here. Oop. You guys hear enough? I might have to... Okay, there we go. All right. Yeah, so an outline of what we're talking about today. So, you know, the kind of the backdrop of, of this is that uh, gradient boosting regressors perform well as single supervised learning models um, in general. And so tree-based models have been shown to outperform, outperform neural network architectures for medium-sized tabular style data like numeride data. And so this has been uh, written about um, a little bit and there's one paper here, uh, why do tree-based models still outperform deep learning on tabular data? And that gives a little insight into, into that. And, you know, indeed, we use the, the gradient boosting regressors as the uh, kind of the benchmark models for a lot of the numerai scripts that are shared on the internet. Um, while these work very well, they still don't account for all the information that we have available. Um, and each data point is treated kind of independently. And so our goal with this project is to incorporate the error-wise information into the tree building process in order to create a new state-of-the-art model which outperforms the baseline LGBM model. You know, that's our goal here. Um, so the first part of the presentation, we'll talk about like just what is error splitting. You know, we're going to get into the basics of building trees. Um, and the idea here comes from the out of distribution generalization research playbook. So it's kind of a niche area in machine learning research, where, which is actually really, um, it's, uh, you know, the subject of that research is very similar to what we go through at Numerai. It's that there's shifting distributions uh, between training and test data, even within training data and the test data, you can have shifts in the in the data distribution where you know traditional machine learning is based on the idea that uh, the training and the test sets are drawn from the same distribution so just wanted to point out a couple papers here that inspired this work um the one is invariant risk minimization pretty famous paper now um, by arjovsky and uh the other one is called learning explanations that are hard to vary um by Parascandolo. so both of these papers uh, kind of give different ideas for, for how to deal with this problem in general. And I'd uh, recommend reading up on that. Um, and then, so once kind of showing what we're doing, we'll, we'll show a little toy example called the shifted sine wave that I've put together. And then we'll show a little, a couple of results on uh, numerai data. So yeah, in order to do this, I would like to go to a different, Presentation. Okay. Everyone's still with me. Um, are there any questions so far? Probably not. We'll get into this first part and then and then we'll get take some questions. Okay, so here we're going to review how decision trees uh how they grow with a max depth one tree example. And then uh, we'll identify what is a node splitting criterion, and then we'll introduce error splitting there. So how decision trees work for regression. Um a visual example. So we will take uh, some example data um, and 
we visualize each uh, value with a color here. So we'll, uh, we have our data set. Um, we have three features. We have eight eras and uh, one target. So um, we've sorted our data here by era. So does everyone, anyone have any questions about like this data representation? All right. So if we want to build a tree model, you know, one tree, okay. Um, so trees split data and, and we first split data uh, at what's called the root node. Um, and every split always results in two child nodes, okay. A left child node and a right child node. And a split is simply a rule based on one feature and one value. And right here, we can see the rule is that we take some feature and we say when it's less than some value, all the data from that that ha that uh, has this uh, this value for this feature gets uh, funneled to the left child node, and all the data where that feature is greater than or equal to some value is um, is transferred to the right child node. So um, the question is, how do we decide which feature and value to use when we split the data? You know, what is the best way to split it? Because there's um, there's lots of possibilities there. So we choose the split, which allows the greatest information gain. So information gain is the name uh, is given to the node splitting criterion, which is actually a reduction in the variance. So, um, you know, in a, I wrote out here in words, but the math is that, you know, the basic idea is we have the, there's a variance in the parent node, which is the root node, which, which for the root node is all the data there. And then you have a, a variance, um, yeah, so sorry, I left out a, a word here that should be, so the variance in the target, okay, so we're looking at the variance in the target here. Um, so a reduction in the variance would be like the, the parent target variance in the target, and then you subtract the, um, the left child variance weighted by how much data was put into that child and the right child variance. So, um, yeah, so you know the, the weights there just uh, give us you know a good weighted average here. Um, so that's like if, if we make a split, we can reduce the variance in our targets by by this much, um, and that that's what's called information gain. You know, so actually you're gaining information by reducing your variance. Um, <clears throat> so the split with the greatest information gain creates the greatest reduction in variance in the child nodes compared to the parent. And high parent variance and low child variance give the best score, right? So um, let's split this this data set, this root node. So now what we've done, you know, to uh, to find splits, you actually have to sort the data you know, by each feature. So we're just checking feature one right now, um, and we sort by feature one, and we identify the possible split points. And our data has five unique values for every feature, so there are only four possible split points in our data, right? So um, if we look at the first split, then the left child targets are in this orange square, and the right child targets are in the dark gray square, and all the, the parent targets are the entire column, right? So that's like the data that goes into the left child node and the right child node, and these are the, tar you know, the those rows are the data, and these targets are where we check the variance in our computation. So we can com compute the information gain for every possible split here. So in our data, we only had three features and each feature only had four values. So, you know, we only have 12 possible split points. And we found that the best split was actually feature three um, splitting at the value of one. Um, and the information gain there is you know, slightly positive. So on the right side, we visualize what this actually looks like in, in context of our last example. And, um, you know, that's really it. You know, one thing we can see visually is that the, the data that has, um, you know, the feature three greater than or equal to one gets split to the right child node. So now feature three has just, is just homogenous, only has one value in feet, um, for the right child node, where the left child node has all the other values besides, you know, red. So we see like there's no red here. So that's 
that was like the effect of this split. And then what we're saying is that our targets now are, uh, you know, they have, there's less variance now if you, if you compute the variance of this data, these two data sets split up compared to the parent. So now if we use this tree to predict, you know, how do we get a predicted value? Well, we just take our new data point, whatever data point we want, we check feature three, we see if it's less than or equal to uh, one, then it goes to the uh, left child node. If otherwise it goes to the right child node and the predicted value is actually just the average of the target values in each child node. So in this case, you know, if, uh, if the feature three value was less than one, we predict a 50, 50, 0 0.51, slightly higher value. And otherwise, if it was in the other, if it was, uh, if the value of feature three is actually one, we'd predict a 0 0.48. So that's kind of like how trees work right now, like uh, in the original sense. So I guess at this point, I, I we could take um, take some questions if there are any. If not, I will continue then. So now, so, so what is error splitting? So, you know, this is where we've, uh, the point at which we've, we've chose to attack this, this algorithm. So with, uh, with error splitting, we compute the information gain of each error separately, and then we combine these error-wise information gains into one number via averaging, right? And we wish to find the split, which gives the greatest information gain in each error on average. You know, this is really the main idea that's different um, from the original algorithm. Kim, can you be yeah. more specific on contrast that? What, what is different about? Uh, yeah, well, I think um, the next slide can help uh, illustrate that a little bit. So um, unless that you're specifically talking about, uh, well, I think, yeah, I think this helps explain like what's the, what is the difference is that, um, you know, so we, we visualize errors in our data. So previously we had uh, the data set where the date column here, you know, had a lot of different colors. So in order to uh, break out each error separately, you can see that we actually take the data set and separate, separate it so that each error, which is, you know, a date is homogenous. So there's only one, only data from one error in each one of these pictures in each one of these data sets. So to evaluate a split in error splitting, we compute information gain for, for each split across all the errors and average those error-wise information gains. So where before we, we would put all the data together and for each split, we just compute, compute the information gain once. Now we have to do it as many times as the number of errors we have. And we put that into an array um, and then you know, take the mean of that. And that is our new error splitting criterion. So, um, so I think that's really contrasting with, you know, the original split, um, splitting criterion, which, where we take all the data, where we have all the errors together, right? So this is really exactly, like you said, this is the, the contrasting point here where we are trying to gain, you know, performance by, by, yeah. Uh, choosing splits that seem to would seem to work better on average in all the errors because we thought that maybe you know in the naive setting you know you can have very unbalanced performance among errors you know for some split even though you know for the whole entire data set it looks to be the best yeah okay so i wanted to now jump to a um a toy example called the shifted sine wave. So this is just a, like a one dimensional example that was designed to, to really work with this model, you know, to, to kind of show that like what we're assuming is actually happening in, in the algorithm. So um, this toy example is designed to show yeah, what's happening. Um, the underlying assumptions about this kind of research assume that there's some di distributional shift happening in each era or environment. So we start with sine wave as like the base generator in our data example. And from each era, um, we, we have random Gaussian noise, but then we also have a, sh a directional shift to the data that is going to be the same in each era. 
but then for different eras, that shift will be different. So like within the era, the, the shift is the same, but then across different eras, th those shifts are going to be randomly different. So um, what we see here is the, the dark data points is like the, the baseline signal that these that the data is built on, but the, the data is actually the orange points. And so with one era of data, we see that it's like a noisy version of the sun wave and it's been shifted down right so then when we add another era of data we see that we have the original first era but then the second era is also kind of a noisy sine wave but it's been shifted you know not too much here it, it occurs about in the same spot and then as we add another era you see our cloud of points gets bigger where each individual era is uh, just like you know shifted by the same amount um, besides the the random noise that's added onto everything, um, and then so after sixteen eras, you you end up getting like this cloud of of data points, and so like the idea we're trying to investigate then is if we train the model on all the data points just in the traditional setting, you know, and compare that with using our error splitting criterion, which actually has to check each era of data separately, um, and then take a mean of those criterion to find the split like how do these models learn differently right um so this is a yeah this is not really important tiny gt gbt is just like a a small uh pure python implementation of gradient boosted trees um that i first started investigating here um so what we're seeing in, on the left side is like if you train the, the gradient boosted trees in the original setting um, on this orange data uh, you end up getting you know, predictions that look like like this blue line, um, which you know we have some stats here from these predictions um, where the, the the mean squared error, you know, 0.9, and correlation with the targets, which is the green line, is uh, 0.5. And we contrast this now with the error splitting, which is which what we see is that. Um, by using error splitting, the, the model is able to you know, have a much smoother uh, prediction. You know, it's less noisy, and in fact, the uh, the statistic the statistics come out much better. Um, lower mean squared error and uh, higher correlation. So, you know, of course, this is a toy example. This was kind of um, cookie cutter, you know, to make this happen. And so, like uh, in SK Learn's decision tree regressor. Uh, we also implemented this idea, and it has a similar effect. Um, we're on the left side, you have the original, and on the right side with the new error splitting criterion. And then, um, yeah, okay. So that's um, that's an example here, a toy example. So any questions at this point? So uh, is yeah. that out of sample? In other words, if you you really wanted to test it, you would make new eras with distributional shifts that had not been seen before. And does yes. it? Yeah, yeah, this is like, this is like an out of sample evaluation. Yeah. So each new thing that you're predicting would have different random noise and a different shift that wasn't, correct. you know. Yes, correct, yeah. Yeah, it was trained on like, uh, you know, you produce like so many errors for training and then you produce some for test. Yes, this is an out of sample uh, prediction here. Yeah. Okay. So, um, any other questions? Oh, one other thing, which you may yeah. get to in a minute. Um, did you try anything other than the mean? In other words, you've got these different errors and you're going to pick the one that does the best on the average, but you could try different things like uh, which one is got the maximum worst error. You know, you're working on the floor level now or just oh, yeah. trying, you know, just anything other than the mean. Did any other alternatives? Uh, well, I'm glad you're asking that question because at least you followed uh, the presentation to this point. So yes, we actually did. That was one of the the first kind of additions we made to this idea. Um, exactly. We're, we're interested in, 
actually what we're what we're most interested in is in improving the the minimum like you're saying right like we want our worst era to be we want now, to i ask that comfort. specifically because my solution right. to this problem has always been i only make models on a single era pretty much everything i've done in numerai the last three years is every single model I make is on one era and then I wow, make an ensemble okay. of that. And then I decide, you know, how I'm going to balance the ensemble. If, you know. okay. But every time I try like raising the minimum directly, it really does badly. And that, that never seems to work, although it, it intuitively seems like it ought to, but it just doesn't when I do it. <laughs> well, what we'll, yeah, what we'll be getting to is the results on the numerai data. And yes, it doesn't, seem it like doesn't work this well at all like it doesn't seem to work um you know it's, it, we have lots of different tests and results we got into but yeah the general idea is that it's like the idea does work slightly but like you said it seems like if you just go to raise the minimum you end up you know somehow losing the performance any kind of like performance uh, on average which is kind of an interesting thing um in itself but yes, we did. We actually, um, you know, MDO had a great idea to implement what's called the, the Boltzmann operator, which is a, which is a parameterized, um, you know, formula to, um, you can take our list of numbers where we could compute the mean, but you, you get a parameterized way to get a smooth transition from a minimum value through the mean to a maximum value. So with this parameter, we can actually adjust what the algo is looking for whether it's, you know, um, trying to improve just the worst era, so the minimum, or whether it's trying to improve the best era, so that'd be the maximum, or somewhere in between. Yeah, and I've tried other things like the mean plus the minimum, you know, and maximize right. that. Never works. The mean is always, always the best, and you're just trying to improve generalization, but I'm also, specifically with numeri, trying to avoid any catastrophic errors ever you know like right can. yeah and i don't know you know it's obviously we could get into a long conversation about that idea in general but it, i did through this i've learned a lot about that there are just are definite shifts in what happens from error to error is like how i can you know describe it the easiest um you know where this in this toy example every the, like the thing that's happened the, the way the general, you know, signal is the same every time. We're shifting something about the distribution, but the general target shape is is the same. And I think that's why it works so well in this case. Where I think in numerai, in the real world, in finance, like the thing that you're actually shooting for, like compared to your features, actually changes. Yeah, and this is right. a sine wave somewhere in there, and in numerai, it's not a sine wave. <laughs> the next yeah, it's time, it's not a sine wave, and it could change directions, and it could change how high it is, and things like that. Um, exactly. So we're we're searching for what is actually fundamental that is invariant in some sense, if there even is such a thing. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's uh, exactly. Thanks for saying it like that. Because that's uh, all right. That's uh, well, that's what we're going proceed. For. We'll, we'll yeah, I only got a couple more slides. Um, so, so get back into just like you know a basic idea of like so how does this um, work on with the numerai data? So if you have used this uh, algorithm that I just described, but instead of building a depth one tree, you go to like a depth five um, and you know, use a learning rate of uh, 0.01 and trading for like 5,000 trees, which which is what the baseline model does pretty well, you know, on with those uh, those parameters, um, you can, you get this kind of result. Okay, so the baseline here, um, so these are, you know, the data points here are the correlations, you know, for each of the, you know, the predictions with the, the Cyrus target, um, for each era. And so, um, you know, for the baseline, you get a, an average correlation of, of 0 0.028 over the entire uh, test set um, that goes up, you know, pretty recent. I think it's from a few, like a few months ago was the last era that we have, um, you know, and a core sharp of 1.28. So this looks pretty good. This is kind of like our baseline. And if we just use error splitting, that's using the mean 
um, like you said, uh, you know, it's not terrible, but it, it doesn't really compare very well. You have a, a lower mean, you know, a lower sharp. Um, but what we found is that uh, if I combine, if now at the split level, I can actually combine the two criterion that we just looked at. So the original and the split criterion. So it's like just an, an, uh, an average of the two. Then when we build this model, it actually does perform a little bit better. Um, we get a higher mean core and higher core sharp, you know, and this is trained for the same number of iterations, you know, with the same parameters. The only thing we changed here is the, is the criterion that is being used. However, it still like, isn't really mind blowing. It's not like, you know, a huge improvement, but it is, it is somewhat better. Um, so like that's, that's really the, <laughs> the last result I'm going to show. I don't have uh, anything else, but, um, but yeah, there are, you know, there's other ideas. There's this, um, this idea that uh, Wiggle Muse just brought up about uh, whether we want to, because it seems like actually what we want to do is, is improve the worst era, right? So we, we would use something more like a min um, and it just didn't find that to work. Like it just empirically, like just those models didn't generalize as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just, maybe we'll open it up for a little discussion or questions, but yeah, the basic idea exactly was to find an invariant predictor at the split level. Um, you know, one thing I just, last thing I'll point out is that I guess when you're finding a split, the one thing is that you're always just looking at like, a, it's kind of like a one dimensional process at each time you're finding a split where you build a tree, it becomes a high dimensional, uh, you know, nonlinear predictor with incorporating lots of your dimensions of data. But like when you're finding each split, you're always just like checking on one dimension at a time, which, um, you know, I don't want to say it's a drawback to it, but I think like that's kind of, um, because what you what you find is there isn't any one feature like that just works really well by itself, right? So it's always going to be a combination of features that's going to work well. And so if we're trying to pick a best split, I'm just thinking like for maybe pushing this to the future is that we want to find a way to analyze like the combinations of several features together, right? And and, and maybe look at uh, something, you know, something there uh, inside the algorithm. Yeah, you can definitely do that. I mean, the, the problem is I see, uh, I haven't used the boosting libraries too much just because I feel like everyone is doing that. So I just don't want to do it. But <clears throat> but I have used decision trees heavily for even before Numeri. And uh, uh, when you start getting into like oblique splits where you're combining, you know, like a, one thing I used to do is do a random linear combination of several features to create a new feature just for that split and then you'd split on that and then you'd make a new one and you got to <laughs> save you know all the parameters that you used uh then you get you know things that uh, on different planes of splitting uh sometimes it helps sometimes it is just more work um but the the, the way these libraries are set up you know they're <clears throat> they're not set up for that so you got to do a bunch of custom split functions and stuff like that there's something called uh Random forest, you're probably familiar with, but there's rotated random forest, which is essentially yeah. uh, transforming the data set um, for each tree uh, with a like a random projection. So now, right, like a tree, like a a, um, a, a, a rotation. Uh, so major. each tree in the forest gets different columns, essentially. Uh, created features from that rotation and right. that can get you it smooth things out but you you end up with i mean you're always sort of approaching the same limit that you get with you know whatever's <clears throat> the, right. the the boosting libraries do do very well it's hard to beat them uh by very much as you're yeah. finding out my my idea about or my intuition about numeri specifically in terms of its shifting um, is that it's not really the shape. I mean, the shape it's like if, like if it was a sine wave, like if it was just some curve we're trying to find in each era, in each live era, 
sometimes it's the sine wave sometimes it's whatever it changes like you've noted and you've made i you've made 3d graphs but you've posted before right um yeah. but i don't think the answer of what that shape is like gonna be is sort of in the data i think there's probably an abstraction that maybe doesn't exist or we haven't discovered yet anyways uh, at least that anyone knows about publicly is it's sort of the reaction to the features that's invariant on one level of abstraction i don't know if that makes any sense but <laughs> there's like a formula in there somewhere that's kind of invariant but you're not going to find it but it's not yeah, simple, it's not just going to be a simple um a simple thing. mapping of this to that yeah. i mean what you're I always is, just um, yeah doing a I'm compromise of what's oh. happened in the past go ahead yeah, one an idea that came off of this is to what I call directional error splitting. So, um, what I realized is that you know, so when you make a split of your data on using the whole all the data, right? Like everything to the left gets one value, everything to the right gets another value. Um, you know, one value is always higher than the other. That's why you split because you start creating your your how you make your predictions, right? Um, when you have all the data together, you know, you just, I call it direction, like whether the left is higher than the right child node, as far as the predicted value. When you have all the data together, it does like, there's only one direction, right? There's only, you're pulling all your data. But what actually happens is when you look at each era, that direction is different, can be different, right? So like one, one split, um, if you look at the direction of the predictions, in every era is actually going to be different. So like what's what like a prediction that's high in one era and will end up like, you know, end up and will end up being low in another area based on the same feature. Like so if that, that features, you know, in one era, like the high values for the feature produce high high predictions, but then in another era, the high values produce a low prediction, right? And what I found is that there isn't any single split for any of the features that produce like a consistent direction in all eras, right? And that actually, you know, it's actually kind of looking at like, if you look at like a correlation of the feature with the targets, just like, like one dimensionally, you know, you, you, we do find there aren't any features that like have a consistent positive correlation with the target, like for every error. There are some errors, always some errors that have like a, a negative correlation. Um, and so like that kind of transfers over to this splitting idea where, yeah, actually, you know, if you're looking for a one dimensional invariant predictor, like we can say, you know, I can say it doesn't exist, right? So if there is going to be some kind of invariant predictor, you know, it's got to be more complex more complex than just right. one one dimension right so, so tim do you think maybe a greedy algorithm might not be a way good way to find that because it has to only kind of look one dimension at a time and then but maybe the invariant thing you kind of have to search over uh, at least like interactions um like sort of two splits like all potential uh sort of pairs yeah well yeah what came to mind like i it would still be a greedy style algo but yeah imagine that you could actually test like the information gain of like every possible tree right instead of every possible split but you could start with like a depth two tree yeah. where you split once and then each child node you have to split again and you have to check every single possibility there right yeah and then maybe if you do that you could find stuff that um is consistent i mean eventually you would imagine like if you could split your tree you know deep enough you would find some trees that do work co positively consistently on every era right i mean maybe not though i don't know like one like a, a, that would be like a single tree we know that we can create forests of trees that do that right it's just like by by using the gradient boosted uh, models and like kind of overfitting our data, we can always get like in sample data to be, you know, all all positive errors. But um, but yeah, like, but that's what exactly you like, what you often see in the in the in the weird errors. If if something has got a strong tendency, it's just a total reversal. You're just like, what is up with this error? Everything right. is backwards. 
<laughs> there's just nothing you, you could do with it. It's just, <clears throat> so it's just like 90% of the time it does this. And then sometimes it's just flipped. <clears throat> it's, it's usually not just like uncorrelated all of a sudden. It's just reversed. Right. Yes. And that's, yeah. And that's the dangerous thing. Right. And <clears throat> exactly. And like, from what I've seen, it's like, uh, I think you're getting it, trying to get it at that. It's like, do we even know that anything consistent even exists in the data? And if it doesn't, you know, then the well, one thing that, that definitely helps is more targets. In other words, you just make these models with totally different targets uh, and then mix them together because you're, it, the, the mappings in a tree, you can't really like mix targets other than just making a new target as an average, uh, but which is, which works too. But <clears throat> if you are just, you know, different targets that have different correlations, different distributions, they shift a little bit differently. And then that averaging of those tends to increase uh, generalization. I have long made my own targets in various ways uh, by you know, subtracting things out or whatever, whatever. Um, and I think some features, some like contextual features help. In other words, we each row is since you're splitting on these sort of individual values, which only apply to that row. Uh, do we know at now numeri data is highly regularized. So the buckets are basically even all the time, but each row is not uh contextually you know in the middle of the data so a row which with a, a feature level you know some feature is you know got a four but its row is sort of an outlier almost among all of the other rows in that era and the four doesn't tell you that but a four combined with the knowledge that this row globally is an outlier in this era and you could have a direction of that outlierness right uh mm -hmm. that if you you can turn that information into a feature itself and those sort of things where it's incorporating overall knowledge of the era in the individual features or dealing with that in some way uh that's where i think we might find some more invariance because the the just the knowledge of the individual feature just isn't enough uh like you were saying, yeah. but 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 inside each era, isn't maybe maybe I a little lacking understanding. Understanding, but inside each era, the mean value for every feature is is like the middle, isn't it? Yes, but the mean value of each row is not the middle. So we've got yeah, let's say look at like the mean of all the features together. In other words, if we've got a row with uh, let's say we've got an era with only ten rows in it, right? Uh, if if some, uh, the average of each feature is basically going to be the middle value, right? But right. you might have a row which every feature is a one. Okay. So that's a weird row. And you can't okay. tell just looking at one feature that that's a weird row or how weird it is or whatever. I and uh, I've talked it's about like, that oh, before. One row is all like extreme values. It's not like the values are near the mean. In other words, if you did a distance matrix of, of an era, yeah. it would be roughly spherical and some rows would be towards the center and some rows would be on the outer surface. And that's where I'm finding uh, valuable information is just where is this row uh, contextualized globally in this particular era? It, in other words, you could have the, you could have a, an identical row in terms of values in two different eras, but one could be an outlier in its own era and the other one could be more towards the center and that's important i see that's but the actual values are the exact same thing which is not going to you're not going to pick up you know if you don't do things arrow wise right so yeah and that's exactly the kind of information that seems like could be like you said could be added to this kind of these are kind of algorithms right because it's about uh about the era itself interesting Have you found that to be useful, Wiggle Muse? For yes, and I mentioned it actually last time. We I I mentioned it a few times before because I did sort of a uh, a survey of that where I would look at 
sort of like the uh, basically, yeah, how, how, how far from the center each row was in the data. And there's no, um, if it's up or down or in, you can't uh, get polarity from it. In other words, you can't make it, you can't use it to predict whether a stock is going to be low or high, but you can use it to predict whether it's going to be extreme or not uh, to some extent. Uh, and I found originally that, that it seemed useful at first, and then I couldn't do anything with it. But I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, or whenever we, at the last one, I guess it was a while ago, uh, that I had been taking my big ensembles, and like I say, I make a model for each era. So we've got, you know, 10, 50 eras or so. I've got 10, 50 models, and, and some of them I've got times 36 because they make them for each target. So I've got like 36,000 models that I'm, that's why my, my pipeline runs for eight hours a day. <laughs> and I use the queued submissions feature, right? So, <clears throat> so I've got a million models and I'm assembling together. And I recently added a filter uh, to the ensembles where I go back and I look at, do I want to include this uh, set of predictions for this era in the ensemble or not? And I sort of check whether it matches up structurally I know it'd be kind of be kind of vague with its original training era. So if it was trained on era 500, I sort of look at the behavior of the prediction of the actual target from era 500 and look at my new predictions because you can look at a live era without targets and sort of determine where the rows are in that distance matrix type of deal. And then you can see whether the predictions that you're making on the live era, even without a target, are kind of structurally similar to the ones they were trained on. And our idea was if they're not, maybe it's just kind of not working well for this era, this today. Uh, <clears throat> and so I just throw it out. So, so now I'm making these giant ensembles and I'm, uh, and I'm throwing out 80% of it when I do the average. Uh, and so far it is working like super well. <laughs> which is surprising, but we're in a heavy burn period here and it's only been, you know, I've got like six weeks of data or something. Uh, so it could just be that it works well right now and then things change again. Uh, it'll be reversed and all of the ones I'm filtering will be the bad ones. Right now they're the good ones compared to the sort of baseline ensemble, but it's interesting stuff and I've, it's something I've been trying to get to work for like two years in various ways. And some it's been very tantalizing uh, because it seems like it's something there, but then it just fails. So yeah, I've got that well. I was gonna say that sounds very promising. Yeah, because like the recent uh, recent eras do seem to be kind of outside of the normal or at least the bulk of the distribution of the data. And so any sort of uh, tools for filtering and trying to figure out what is similar in the training set or yeah if, if your predictions are sort of looking like anywhere in the training data um, seems potentially useful because yeah, right now it's working it's working like magic in fact uh, most yeah. of the time uh, but it's just I I know numerai which, uh, which model which model is that let's take a look uh, I have to uh, make you. I'm, I can't <laughs> even type on my current thing here, but I, I can show you later in the okay. chat. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, it sounds to me like I mean that's the thing. Like if there isn't any invariant thing that like is always in all the features, then what we're talking about is more of a timing thing, right? Where you have to learn which, you know, like you said, like if you have. You basically hope that if, if what's happening now is kind of wild, well, maybe something similar has happened in the past and you can use your model that was just trained on that time period, right, of the past. Um, and that will perform well, even if that only happened, you know, for 10 weeks out of the last 500 weeks, right? So um, that's almost like, you know, a timing thing. But like, if you do that smartly, like that could potentially, you know, if you always get, get it right, right, like that's an invariant thing yeah when i've done the more intuitive thing that i think a lot of people have tried in that you sort of is this current live era what eras in the past is it most like and you might do a similarity yeah. measure of something that mm -hmm. never seems to work because even if it is like or 
for one thing, the near, the the live errors are always closest to the ones that were last week. <laughs> they're, you're talking about the, the features, like if you compare the features, but I think yeah. with, with your technique, you're you're talking about comparing the, the targets. With right. The so so, so I'm I'm actually taking the predictions that I make, and then for, it's complicated, but. <clears throat> A yeah. more sensible sounding thing is to yet yeah, to, to look at today's era's features because you don't have a target and uh, see do some similarity measure. But you always find out that the most recent things are correlated most with the most recent right. other things that just passed. Mm -hmm. And that's not very helpful other than do what's been, you know, trend just, following yeah, essentially. Four weeks, right. And if you do find some of the past that match up pretty well, is that helpful in terms of how the old one matched up with the targets map? And it doesn't, it doesn't help. Okay. The only thing that helps is just a, you know, big freaking ensemble <laughs> where you don't know what's going to happen and you just generalize everything. That's what, that's what always worked best for me. I can't, I can't seem to beat it where I like, you know. <clears throat> well, that's great insight there. But your filter, your filtering on like is are your new predictions somewhat structurally similar to the predictions from on the training data? Is that right? Um, imagine here's a very simple way to do it. Um, to center uh, the data, the feature data, so that the middle value is zero. So now half of it is negative, half of it is positive, or actually most of it is zero, but <clears throat> and now uh, add up the absolute values of each row. So a plus two and a minus two are now both plus two. Because again, there's no sort of polarity information in this. You're, you're just looking at which rows are farthest from the center. And that's a very quick way to do it. Just add up the row, feature values of the row into a single number. So if a row has a one, and a two and a three, then it's uh, a six. <clears throat> and if it's all zeros, because it's centered, then it's a zero. So now your row with a six is a lot farther away from the center than the zero, right? Again, I know it's hard to follow this just in words. Um, but then you'd, you'd end up with a single number for each row that basically tells you how far from the center it is. Now, if you look at your training, um data do that with a training error where you've got a target and do the same thing with the target so or, or basically the target's already it's a single number so but center the target and look at um each uh target individually so you got your plus twos and your minus twos and you'll you're going to find that those are the, the same basically so again absolute values so if you look at um, all of the rows in the training era that were plus two. And again, we've centered the data, so that's the highest value. Um, and then look at the rows, uh, the, the single number and how far it is away from the center. You'll find that that is got a, you'll, you'll see the same ordering every time. And this, and why I, I've been trying to get this to work for so long is because the order, the sort of relationship between that uh, outlierness of the rows and the outlierness of the target is invariant. Like 100% of the time, every single era is the same, uh, at least on the Nomi target. I think a couple of the weirder targets, it varies a little bit. Um, but I'm like, I've never seen anything in Numeri that's always the same. There's got to be something here that's useful. But because you can't use it to predict, is the stock going up or down? Only, is it going to do something more than the others? It's either going to be up or down, but you don't know which. And basically, the whole game is figuring out whether it's going to go up or down. In other words, if you can figure out if a stock is going to go up or down without any magnitude information, you're gonna get good scores on Numeri. And you can, you can just randomize your predictions uh, in terms of magnitude. If you get the polarity right, you'll just do very well. 
And right. if you get the magnitude right, uh, but the polarity is random, you will never do well. <laughs> So getting the magnet, so that's what I'm talking about is, is it, is it, it's, it's like invariant in terms of the magnitude, but not the polarity. And I thought that would be more useful than it seemed to be at first, but knowing the magnitude turned out to be uh, just not very useful in terms of getting good numerized scores. Uh, and I tried lots of different ways to get it to be useful, or at least give me a bump and performance. Uh, but it was just, it was all over the place. It's catastrophic sometimes. And, and this, uh, and I basically have given up on it several times. And then I was like, what if I just filter this certain kind of, just because the models are set up that way where I can sort of check whether they match up in that same invariant way. Uh, and right now it's working. So again, I, that was a lot of words. It probably doesn't make sense, but there is some invariance uh, in terms of magnitudes, but not polarities in terms of mappings between features right. and targets in numeri. Now, what it reminds me of is that like something I've just seen in, in finance is that you can predict the vo uh, volatility pretty well, right? And, it, and that's exactly what you said uh, when I brought this up a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, it's one of those things. Like, that, yeah, like I can build a model that predicts volatility of you know the, the S and P five hundred pretty well. Like, in in the sense that we look at directional predictions, where like, yeah, we could have a correlation of maybe even point two or something, where we never see that in numeri. But, um, but yeah, like if we're not getting the direction, then it's really hard to turn that into you know a good directional so, trading. So that strategy. was the discoveries. Like, yeah. I can tell. All right. I know that among these rows, on a, on a, on a row level, it, there's, I mean, it's not that specific, but if you're grouping sort of things in buckets, the mean values of these things are always at the same order. Uh, but, yeah. you know, sort of, so that's what I'm predicting. Yeah, these are, these are going to be the movers are, you know, most of the movers are going to be in this group, or most of the ones that don't do anything are going to be in this group. So that's the discovery, but it doesn't, it doesn't correlate to whether it's up or down or not. So, right. It does seem like you should be able to use that. Like, right. That's like, seems very, right. Funny. And you look at it, you're like, this is awesome. It's like the same again. The, uh, when I say 100% of the errors that, that matches up, it's 100% of the errors. <laughs> I was amazed because I, I figured it would, you know, just, just wouldn't be the case sometimes, but it's always the case. Um, and it's not useful information, maybe. But so the thing with the filtering is like, because I was trying to use that to sort of come up with the polarity somehow. Or, but now I'm just like, okay, my model's going to predict whatever it's going to predict. Because the best, well, the other thing I noticed was that my best performing models didn't conform to this pattern at all. In other words, I would just look at my models, the ones that were doing good. And I would see, okay, I bet these are at least sort of corresponding to this sort of structure that I'm seeing where they pick out just naturally. It just happened, you know, the, the magnitudes, the ones th with magnitude that I expect. And they didn't. I mean, it's just not that strong of an effect overall. Uh, even though it's always there, you can make a model that's high performing without conforming to this pattern. So it's not like it's mandatory to conform it to get good scores on numeri, um, which is my right. criteria. Um, so again, so then I'm like, okay, so it's not important. It's just this interesting artifact that I've discovered. <laughs> I can't find a way to use. Uh, but so the, 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 the idea now is basically I give it up on it. I was like, okay, what if I did just find the ones that do match up to this pattern and throw the rest out of the ensemble? And then Didn't I just- you say that they all match up? You said that all the, like all the errors, this this uh, thing that you're looking yeah, at, all the all errors, of the all yeah. of the training errors with the given targets, but then when I look at, in other words, I'm looking at my predictions right. as if they were a target. Okay. Putting them into buckets, pretending they're yeah. they're the target, even though they're my predictions. Yeah. And then seeing whether they match the pattern. So okay. they may or they may not. Um, 
If okay. they do, then I'm I'm saying, okay, maybe since they're getting this part right. Uh, oh, I see. That, so that, you only use the models that produce predictions that get that distribution correct. Right. In other words, oh, it's okay. get, it's giving you a hook that you normally don't have because wow, that's, you that's when you're predicting true. live data, you don't have a target. Yeah. So it's giving you like a fake target and you're saying, okay, I predict this is going to be true uh, about the live data. And I know it's going to be true because it's been true 100% yeah, of the time be, on the true. real targets. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then if that is true, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, that. give that prediction yeah. a boost and essentially I'm going to not use the rest of them. Yeah. And again, things, <laughs> plenty good. of things look good for a while and then All they right. don't. So yeah. this, what I've noticed in my other uh, versions of doing this is that, yeah, it works be probably because it's about volatility and magnitude, is that sometimes it's just world beating. Now, am I getting all 100 percentiles, you know, this, but then it gets zero so <laughs> a percentile. Uh, but right now, especially when you're looking at the dailies, it's just every day I look at the baseline and then I look at the filtered version. And the filter and the baseline in some cases is doing very bad. And every day the filtered version is positive. It's always positive. So I'm like, this is awesome. But you know. Well, yeah, basically it, the thing it, that would be different is like uh, which eras go into your ensemble then. Like that's what you'd be perhaps would change as time goes by, right? Yes. So, so every looks, yeah. every prediction I'm using is a potentially different set of errors in the ensemble. So right. that's not fixed anymore. So that's an adaptive thing. Is it? I've been meaning to do it, but I haven't done it yet. I'm I'm moving across the country at the end of the month here, so I've been doing nothing packing and stuff so lately. But <clears throat> but so I haven't had a lot of research time. But I I did want to check. You know. Just yeah, that. Is, is it always if it, if it yeah. if it's picking the same ones every single time just because those are the ones that happen to match? That that, that could still mean that the models are going to work, but it's a little more interesting if it if it's adaptive. But you wouldn't yeah. expect it to to change much day to day. You would right. expect it to change with the distributions, which, as you know, because you've plotted them, is or most of the time they're very similar, and then one day it goes, and, and then it's completely yeah. different. So I need, you know, more months of data to really uh, get behind this idea in a big way. Uh, that's, that's I'm not staking. Cool. I'm not staking at all right now. Actually, I pulled all my stakes because I needed all my money to move across the country. <laughs> so your, uh, yeah, that sounds great. Um, we're running out of time, but that is actually, uh, I think, a good sort of uh, intro to what I want to talk about next time. We need to be talking about. Uh, trying to find regimes and trying to like sort of build models jointly while while finding regimes, um, and uh, yeah, so it's sort of definitely sort of in line with this trying to find which eras work for a particular model and trying to sort of automatically determine that. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming and listening. Are there any final questions before you go? Well, thank you, Tim, for presenting, and thank you, Wiggle Muse, for uh, talking so much with us. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Very nice. <laughs>